Welcome to Stream of Conscience, brought to you by Democracy for America, Fairfield County, where we believe that change is possible and you can make it happen. I'm your host, John Hartwell. Our guest today is Lieutenant Governor Nancy Wyman. A Brooklyn native, Nancy came to Connecticut in 1973 with her husband and settled in Tallinn. She served nine years on the Board of Education, where she became Vice Chair, the beginning of a distinguished career in public service. In 1986, she was elected to the State House from Tallinn, then ran and won in 1994 for controller, serving as a Democratic check during the Republican administrations of Roland and Rell. Elected Lieutenant Governor in 2010 on the ticket with Stanford's Dan Malloy, Nancy is a key member of the first Democratic administration in 20 years. Yes. Nancy, welcome to Stream of Consciousness. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is wonderful. Well, I want to talk about, first of all, the first year and a half in this job. You guys have gone through two legislative sessions now. There was a very yeah. contentious budget a year ago where you were faced with a $3.3 billion shortfall in revenues coming in the door. But uh, you've also done some terrific work in terms of uh, educational reform and uh, moving the state forward in a lot of different ways, uh, in earned income tax credit. So let's just quickly look at all of that together. You know, it, it really has been. The last uh, 17 months have been very, very exciting. And with this governor, you know, you're constantly on a roll. You're constantly moving, and that's what's really great about us. We both love to be uh, solving the problems, getting out there and doing the things that we really believe that are correct for the people of the state. And at the same time, um, going out and not hiding under the dome by no, any means, but out there talking to people, letting people know what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, you're right, we, we walked in here with a deficit that was unbelievable. Um, at that time, it, you know, we didn't know where to go. We sat in this office for many, many days and, and months seeing what can we do, how can we uh, address this budget. The one thing that everybody should know is that uh, for years, as the controller, I talked about generally accepted accounting principles. Right. And, and it talks about transparency and honesty and budgeting. Well, the day that, that the governor and I were sworn in, he came back to his office and signed an executive order that said we were going to have our books um, on generally accepted accounting principles. And these and, are the same principles that the towns already have to use. Absolutely. Towns and businesses, everybody else, but, right. the, but government, the government. Government, the state government. So we changed that around. We really believe that this is a, a way of transparency. So we came in there, we looked at this budget, and it was very, very difficult. It mm -hmm. was a very difficult time for all of us. But we came in with a, a budget that um, raised taxes, which we really didn't like to do, but knew we had to do it. We cut as much in, in state government as possible. And we also negotiated with our, um, with our, our employees and really came out with, we think, some great um, negotiations, not only for now and cutting the budget, but for the future where we had to deal with unfunded liabilities. Mm -hmm. So we have, I think, and, and people are now finally realizing that we have cut our unfunded liabilities almost in half. Really? In one year. Wow. By coming in and doing what we did. Mm -hmm. We're going to have people work a little longer. We've had people resign. About 13,000, I mean, sorry, 3,000 people resigned mm -hmm. and, and retired in one Took year. Early retirement. And uh, mm -hmm. we didn't have an early retirement program. Okay. It was basically if you don't retire now, you, are, like all of us, will be paying a little bit more into the mm -hmm. funds. Mm -hmm. So they chose not to, to pay more into the funds, mm -hmm. so they took, a, they they took their retirement. Mm. Mo what you'll see probably by 2029. Um, that all of uh, 2022, I think it is, all of our um, employees won't re retire till they uh, won't retire before they're 63 or 65 years old, mm -hmm. uh, which saves us an awful lot of money by keeping these people employed. Right. All these gadgets of early retirements, when you give bonuses for people to leave, mm -hmm. it was so costly. And then to they us. come back as consultants. Yeah, <laughs> that's true, John. But or or they we have to keep them on our health care and mm. they're not paying any part of it. Mm. So we have to kind of change that. And so we've been doing that with the governor and I and, and that was good. So we came out with a budget. Um, it was balanced. People knew what was in it. Now I know a lot of people didn't like the tax increases. We didn't like it, but it had to be done. 
And so, you went out, I think there were 17 town halls yes, that the governor were. and you did. There were 17 town halls, and we went out there, and the governor gave his speech and told everybody what was in the budget. And then um, I played the old Vanna White and <laughs> went near the microphone, and people would come up and talk to, ask the governor questions right. and, and talk to them. We had, uh, um, you know, we did this for every, you know, I don't know, three times a week or something like that, went all over the state. Um, and you're right, it was about 17 of them. And, you know, so people had to understand that mm -hmm. we were, we wanted to hear what they had to say. Right. Many of the things we've changed, we changed because of what they said. Okay. Uh, we took some of their advice. Mm -hmm. But they also understood that we weren't hiding on the decisions we made. We said things because we really believe that this will turn the state around. We have to look for a firm fiscal base in the state. We haven't had that. We have to get rid of all this unfunded liabilities. Um, that's not the way you run business. That's not the way you run your, even your local towns. Mm -hmm. And we sure as heck can't afford to do it in, in state government. Now, I understand that in order to switch over to GAAP, the generally, counted, uh, generally accepted counting principles, that there's a, there's a GAAP liability, or a GAAP GAAP, as I like to think of it. a GAAP GAAP. Uh, that uh, we actually need to set aside money over a period of years in order to offset this accounting change. That, that's absolutely true. And what, what it is, is um, we had two separate books, sets of books in the two state. Two sets of books. Yeah. Well, <laughs> nobody else can do that, but we did. Right. And one was reporting under GAAP that mm -hmm. we had to send to the federal government. And the other was um, our, what I call the loosey-goosey accounting system. Mm. Um, where we didn't pay our bills on time, and so we extended it for one, one extra day, and by extending it for one extra day, um, it looked like we balanced our budget, and it didn't balance So extending the budget. it for one extra day actually means moving it from the 30th of June, June. the end of one fiscal year, to the 1st of July, the right. next fiscal year, and, and, right. and voila, our budget is balanced uh, for this year. True. But next year we got a problem, right. and then we and just push it forward every year, year. And, right. and that's what was happening all mm -hmm. these years. We never really was honest with the people of the state. Mm -hmm. We're not going to do that anymore. Okay. There is a gap deficit, but we will pay that down as we go. Um, it is too big of a deficit to pay all at once. So what we will do is we will keep our books gap uh, accountable right now, and then we will start paying down the okay. back debt. So. At the same time that you were going through this budget struggle, and I think it was a struggle, mm, it took it a long time, it took an extra session of the, of the legislature, it, yeah. I or it took, it took uh, dealing yeah. with the unions and they had votes and they had more votes, and right. uh, so it was, a, it was a long struggle. At the same yeah. time, it looked to me like you were doing some very innovative things, some, some forward-thinking things, such as the earned income tax credit and uh, paid sick leave. Could you talk about that? Yeah, they, they are, yes, we can. Um, and I will tell you, the governor and uh, Senator Looney, um, the majority leader of the Senate, who has been tried for years and years to do this earned income tax relief, um, brought it forward, and we all agreed that this should be done. Mm -hmm. And what people don't understand is what that has done is we've put some money back into the people's pocket of poorer people. And that, and how? What do they do with it? Poor people spend their money immediately, mm -hmm. so it helps a little bit in the. It helps in the economy again. Mm -hmm. First of all, because then they don't have to be on state-run programs. Number one. Number two, they have the ability to go and and take money and purchase what they need for it, which stimulates the local, uh, the local stores. And I think we should point out that this earned income tax credit goes to people who are working. Yes, absolutely working. Who are paying payroll taxes through right. their jobs, right. but who are not making enough money to actually pay income tax. That's, that is true. And then when it comes to income tax time, they file an income tax return, but instead of paying income tax, they actually get money back from the government, which is kind of like a rebate of some right. of the money that's in their payroll taxes. Which is similar to what we did years and years ago to everybody in the state and gave them rebate really? tax. Oh yeah, years ago. But now these people who will spend that money again mm -hmm. uh, will put it back right into the economy. So this is a, is a plus. Now, my understanding is that um, because this was the first year of that program, mm. um, that we're actually costing us more than we expected. Yes, it, it is. And the fact that we have 
um, people now just taking any kind of job, and so they're working and getting lower, um, lower pay. Of course. Uh, right. But you know what? It's still balancing out. We're still doing okay with it, um, and it still will help our economy in the long run. So we will adjust our budget to that. And what about paid sick days? How's that working out? Uh, well, you know what? It, it, it's really kind of interesting. It, uh, people say, oh, well, you know, these small businesses can't afford it. Uh, it, it it's for people that have businesses um, that are not really the mom and pops. They are businesses that have higher mm -hmm. uh, amounts of people. And you know what? We haven't seen the results of it yet, but it's the right thing to do. You don't want somebody, uh, if you go to a restaurant, you don't want somebody that is sick coming into work because they don't have any paid sick leave. People are adding up that sick leave and they're, they're, uh, they're, not, they're not staying out just to stay out. These pe a lot of these people are lower income people yeah. that are working for businesses that you know um, never gave it before. Now we ha they have abil ability to save it up um, so that they can stay at home when they're really sick. So they or don't stay spread. at home when their children are sick. Well, they need to take care of, of their are, family. A lot of these are single women or single, single or, ta or taking care of their parents now. Or taking now care of their parents, we we've right. got to look at it's a very wide range now. It's many of uh, the grandmothers are taking care of the grandchildren. Right. You know, so we have to look at everything that we're doing now uh, because it truly is a, a different economy, a different world. Now, when before you came to the state legislature, you were on the board of education mm -hmm. in Tallinn for nine yeah. years. Eight years, yeah. Eight years, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, and it's then, okay. And then when you came to the legislature, you, you rose to become co-chair of the Educational Committee. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you have a long history of working on educational issues in the state. Yeah. And this year, um, the governor put forward uh, a very ambitious plan, which again uh, was a bit of a struggle, um, to yeah. reform the educational system in the state. Because one of the biggest problems that we have, in my opinion, is that we have the largest achievement gap in the country. Mm -hmm. We have That's terrific true. schools in some parts of the state and not so good schools in others, and our students are not doing as well as they should be. Right. So can you talk about that educational program? Yeah. What, what happened? Where's it going? Yeah, well, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's, ex, it's kind of exciting, too. Uh, you know, and you talk about my, uh, I got involved because of my two daughters and not liking what that, the school district in my town was doing for their education. I feel like I've come full circle mm -hmm. again. Um, and, and this year, the governor uh, really said this was going to be the year of education. Mm -hmm. And it truly was the year of education. It truly is. The, um, in fact, today, even though you're not uh, the day that we're taping this, um, the Secretary of Education from Washington is coming down, oh, Arnie right. Duncan, yeah, yeah. will be coming down okay. to talk about a waiver that the state will receive. Great. Um, so, for us, uh, the programs that we introduced to the legislature in uh, February this year are now and, and passed in July, in June, in May rather. Um, he, it, it's like the, it was the making of the car. Mm. And now he's putting, coming to get, put the gas in it because mm. we'll have some money to do it. Mm. Um, but we have really addressed, I believe, from early childhood to colleges. Um, to making sure that our children are really having the best prepared, they become the best prepared students in the country. We have, you're absolutely right, we have a very large achievement gap. And the interesting part is, it's not only in town, there's some towns that do an excellent, excellent job, but you know that there are some schools in some towns that do an excellent job where you have schools in the same town that are failing. Mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing now is, why aren't we copying some of the same things? Mm -hmm. You can have two school, two, you know, two schools in the same town that really does not, not equal to each other, and it has nothing to do with where the kids come from. It has to do with the program that's initiated in the school. Okay. And we're excited because the governor has always been an advocate for universal pre preschool. That's right. And universal uh, preschool, and and we have now about a thousand slots for students that will be able to get into a preschool program mm -hmm. and hopefully in September if we can get it up and running mm -hmm. that many. Um, the governor had come in with 500, the legislature decided they want to bring it up to a thousand. We thought that's great, sure. now we'll try to get these, these students in it. Because we know 
that the faster our children learn, and if they're reading by the third grade, mm. we have a, a very good chance of total success for them. If so, they're not, so we have the a major, problem. What were the major pieces of this educational reform? Uh, one of them was the early what, childhood piece, because right. that's a major part to right. us. One of the, the pieces is the commissioner's network. And that is where the commissioner will have about 30 schools in his district that are basically known as, as having trouble. Mm -hmm. And we will come in, they will come in, and we will help them out, getting them, uh, getting them more money, uh, watching over them to making sure that everything is being done properly. Um, and we're trying to get rid of all the bureaucratic the tape, you know, the tape that, that's there now. Plus, also putting money where our mouth is mm -hmm. and steering money to the right places. At the same time, we want to come in and help the teachers. And so, in our program, we have changed the way that we evaluate teachers. I, I think this was a big sticking point, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. It was. But you know what? It's kind of interesting. Uh, one of the unions um, has been always in favor of it, and the outline of how to review them was in there in one of the other unions um, handout book and so that's what we use we mm -hmm. just put a little bit more lines in it mm -hmm. and so but at the end we all came together and we've got a good program going that mm -hmm. the teachers are, are excited about we're excited about mm -hmm. and we it's no longer saying to a teacher you know what let's put you in a room with 30 other people and you can earn your um, education units that way you don't have to do that. If you're having trouble, then, then have somebody in that classroom that can come in and help you out. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're gearing mm -hmm. towards, is not to take the teacher out of the classroom, but to make sure that the teacher feels comfortable and is helping in, in getting the, the job done. And 90% of our teachers, 99% of our teachers probably are doing that. But this is a way to, of catching and helping people out. It's not looking to fire people. It's helping them to build their um, the resources and give them their uh, the skills in that classroom and so that was part of that, our thing we are also looking at changing our technical high schools around mm. um, so that our, our children are being prepared right now we have as Nantuck is a uh, community college up in the Enfield area of the state and they have a wonderful program on engineering that is helping out um, the you know with businesses and so they have businesses coming in there and saying this is what I need mm -hmm. well the businesses now we want them to come into the technical high schools also and say okay let's gear our studies to what's really need out there right now we know that there's going to be a growing need for people in bioscience mm -hmm. well we should be teaching that in yeah. our schools we should be getting them ready for what the future is not just you know, this is what we've always done. So we're going to ch we've changed the the garden uh, the the oversight of the technical high schools. They'll have their own board, um, so that people can concentrate on that. Mm -hmm. um, so we will constantly we're trying to look at all parts of um, how do we train, what kind of people go into teaching, how do we train them. Uh, what do we do with businesses? And we've got to bring everybody together. What's the role of magnet schools and regionalization and all of this? Because it seems to me that much of the problem that we have in this state can't really be addressed as long as we have 169 towns with 169 educational systems. I, maybe we have a few of them that have combined, but not many. So we have, it seems to me we have lots and lots and lots of superintendents in very small systems and we have students who don't cross boundaries. And so the kids in Bridgeport are surrounded by good schools, but, but the schools in Bridgeport are not very good. Uh, and I'm sure the same thing can be said of Hartford or New Haven. But well, we have some very good schools in Bridgeport. We have some very good schools in Hartford. And yes, some of them are magnet schools or inter-district magnet schools or intra-district magnet schools. And the problem is we have to replicate some of those. Yes. And, that's, and we can do that. Is there money in the budget for that? That is. There, there's money give, being given out for magnet schools, and, um, um, and there's, there's incentives to be given out under the ECS formula for, mm. for that. So we're, we're, we are putting money where our mouth is. 
But we also understand that when people were complaining that, you know, well, magnet schools don't take all students. Well, now the law says you will take all students. Okay. And the magnet schools never complained about that. They, they're the ones that say, let us take the, the kinds of every student possible. We still believe that we can do a good job. That seems fundamental in a magnet school yeah, system, right? It really is. And so, and so we have um, the, the all different kinds of um, schools available. Mm -hmm. And we just have to build them up so that we don't have uh, just one, you know, one school in Hartford or two schools in Hartford that are doing a great job. Right. We can build that up, copy what we have in this school, copy what we have in this school, and put it right into these schools. It's, it's an easy way of doing it. Let's talk for a moment about the university level. When you and I were growing up, public education at the state level was, mm -hmm. it wasn't free, but it was very, very inexpensive. Yeah. And I believe now, here in Connecticut, we actually spend more money on the prison system than we do on UConn. Yeah, that, that's changing. <laughs> so it, that's hopefully that, that is changing on higher education in total. Mm -hmm. um, because first of all, we're having, thank goodness, less prisoners. And the fact is that we still have a lot to do in higher education, but we have redesigned our higher education um, a year ago. Uh, we brought a wonderful uh, head of uh, higher education, Dr. Dr. Kennedy, and mm -hmm. um, and, and, and new head of UConn as well, right? New, yeah, who's absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I've met with many of our university presidents and our community college college presidents. They now have an ear in in the building in the in the capital. They have they understand where we want to go. Mm -hmm. We need to bring up our ed higher education system also, and we're working at it. And they all have some new ideas, and, and um, they, they're allowed to do it now. Um, we're accepting, we're excited about this. And, and Dr. Kennedy and uh, Susan Herbst from UConn, um, she's so excited, and she's constantly working out there. So we're seeing a total different look at education. Uh, what we can do about the prices, we have to keep working at that. That's that's the hard thing. Can, and, and we need to make sure that Washington remembers that we need those Pell Grants, that we cannot have somebody out, up in Washington saying, oh, don't give them to the kids, let them earn it on their own. And those things don't happen. Uh, I think that the community college system is an area that we have tremendous upside potential in, mm -hmm. um, especially because there's so many of these kids coming out of Norwalk and Bridgeport and Stratford and places. They need a, a, an inexpensive place to go and get a, a good head start. Right. And the question is, how is it that we keep the expense of that down for them? And rather than loading them up with debt, making it so that it's not so expensive. Well, that's, that's one way of doing it. You, there's a difference between the cost of going for the first two years to a community right. college, or the first two years at U in UConn um, is tremendous. It is. And it basically, it's the same courses given right. um, at the, the community colleges. You just for, don't have the basketball teams. Well, yeah, that's true. You don't have the <laughs> basketball teams or the soccer teams or anything else. But most of those, the students that can't afford it, also not only can go to school, but they also can work. Right. And that's you know, they, and, and and it's not the 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 frills that you have. You know, you know, you're not going to live on campus if you're going to a community uh, a community college. Um, so you you don't have those same frills. But you can make that up when you get into the junior year and your senior year, and hopefully then you'll go to UConn. And then we're going to make sure UConn or or CSU or any of the four university systems, so that you can and we want you to stay here. So we want to make sure that we're training you for the jobs that we have right here. I, I like to switch subjects if we could. Sure. We have just a few minutes left. Um, many of us in Democracy for America uh, have worked very hard on campaign finance reform yes. over the years. I ran for state senate, as you know, right. uh, under campaign and we, elections. Um, yes, we you, you campaigned came. together. That's right. That. Um, That's right. And you know, today the biggest threat, I think, to our electoral system is the Citizens United um, decision at the Supreme Court. And while certainly at the state level we can't overturn it, we can make sure that everyone who is playing in the state is fully um, seen, right. disclosed. So I know there's a Disclose Act that got passed. I don't think the governor signed it yet. What, what's yeah. happening with that? Oh, the, it, the governor will be signing it. It is coming up. Um, you know, sometimes what happens so the people know that when a bill is passed, 
it has many steps to go before it hits the governor's desk. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if that one is right at his attorney's desk yet or if it's still going through the process. Mm -hmm. um, the governor gets it on his desk and he has 15 days to sign it. I don't believe that it has come to his desk yet. Okay, so, but, it, but there's not a problem with that. It's going to go forward. As far as, as far I know, as, you know, as far as I know about it, you don't have the pen, but you're not, no. <laughs> I, yeah, I always get a copy of the pens, but I don't get that, well, I don't get know, that he one. Goes out, he goes out of state. You're the governor, right? That's that's true. But I don't get to sign that. <laughs> oh, really much. It's really kind of interesting when he does that. It's like a a totally different thing. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, you're the governor. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm not going to do anything in a day. So no. He's coming back anyway. And thank goodness, you know, we're, we're very fortunate because the governor does travel back and forth to Washington yeah. to making sure that we're not forgotten in Connecticut. We have a great delegation that's there, but at the same time, we need to, uh, they never had a governor that would go out there and, and fight for what we need. You know, we pay an awful lot of taxes to the federal government. Yes, we do. And it would be nice if some of that money is coming back to us. Yeah. So the governor's out there all the time. Well, I'm sure that we'll be able to get more. Um, it's certain that the governor's been down there, I think, a lot more times than his mm -hmm. predecessors have. And, that's and, for sure. And, um, you know, that's where a lot of the money is. That's right. Uh, Nancy, thank you so much for making time for us today. Thank you for uh, coming in. to come back and talk Please again. Please do. Um, it's, it's terrific. You guys are doing a great job. Thank you so much. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. You can find all our shows on YouTube by going to YouTube slash user slash DFATVNet. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. Or you can send comments or suggestions for a show to info at DFA-TV.net. If you'd like to learn more about progressive political action, we meet at 7 p.m. on the first Wednesday of the month at the Silver Star Diner in Norwalk. We'd love to have you join us. Remember, Change is possible, and you can make it happen. This has been Stream of Conscience, and I'm your host, John Hartwell. Thanks for watching. <laughs>